The Cocaine Starting Five. Five players who during their career used cocaine and ruined their career using cocaine. As complete as this team may have seemed, I was missing a sixth man. Now, a few players I have considered to fill the spot. All they had to do was have a good career and ruin their career with some nose candy. Many of you loved the first one, so it only made sense to do another one. The question is, who will be the sixth man? In this video, we will have three players. Would it be Canada A who was going to become an all-star big in the 90s and could have had a complete career if it wasn't for the snow? Or will it be Canada B who was known for finishing above the rim and being part of a highlight duo, but somehow towards the end of the career, he took a left turn? Or will it be Canada C who was rumored to be better than Jordan? He was bigger, stronger and as athletic, but never played in the league. Who will fill the final spot of the cocaine starting five? But before we answer this question, you should know, my name is Rotomi, I love basketball, I love to talk basketball, and I hope one day you can share that same love for basketball as I. Straight out the gate, Canada A. We have Roy Tarpley, the only player on the list to actually win sixth man of the year, making him fit for the position. Roy is a Michigan legend. Not only has he got the record for the most blocks in the game, the most in a season, he is the all-time Michigan leader this would get him drafted 7th to the Dallas Mavericks in 1986. This was an odd draft. Candidate C was also in this draft. Of 8 of the top picks in this draft, 4 of them had cocaine issues at one point in their career. His though would start in his rookie season. He mentioned that the money, the freedom and the fame started to take over. Passing became what he did in his downtime and the nightlife had a huge grip on him. Although his off-court activities were intense, it didn't affect his play on the court. As a rookie, naturally, he had low numbers. His coach at the time called him an impact player. And this was apparent in his second year. He would win sixth man of the year, averaging 13.5 points and 11.8 rebounds. At this time in history, he was out rebounding Charles Barkley and Dennis Rodman. In fact, he had a rebounding percentage of 21%. And this meant he was collecting one fifth of the misses in a game. This season, he would play an instrumental role off the bench, taking this team to the Western Conference Finals. Although they wouldn't advance to the finals, success continued to follow him into the next season. 19 games in, he would start the season strong, averaging 17 points and 11 rebounds, a solidified double-double. He would also fail his drug test, and this was strike one. He would get suspended, but coming into the next season, he would battle injury and miss half of the games. This didn't affect his play on the court though. He still averaged 17 points, and in fact had a career high in rebounds of 13. It was the following season though, five games he would start the season looking like an all-star, averaging 20 points and 11 rebounds. However, just as everything was going well, we all know what happens. It starts to go downhill and he would get suspended due to a drug test. That was strike two. On the court was not the issue, it was off the court. In fact, he would continue to play overseas and he would do a decent time over there before returning back to the Mavericks after two seasons. He wasn't getting the same minutes as before, but he was still impactful on the court. He's still a rebounding beast. But the snow was too good. He couldn't handle himself and he would miss a drug test. After missing that drug test, it was speculated that he must have been doing cocaine. And that was strike three and he was out of the league. He should have at least had a 10 year long NBA career, but it was only six. And in those six years on the court, he was key to the Mavs, but the league was cracking down on drugs that year. So there was no way that he was going to get away with David Thompson shenanigans, which I speak about in the video before. As a previous sixth man, he makes a very strong case, but the next candidate makes a cracking case. Candidate B, a six-time All-Star and three-time All-NBA player, Sean Kemp. He was drafted to the Seattle Supersonics in 1989 at number 17. Although extremely athletic, he was the youngest player in the league and at the time he needed some guidance. It's important to note that Sean Kemp through the bulk of his career was actually clean. After his rookie year, he became an instant impact player. He would average 15 plus points and eight rebounds for the following 10 seasons. His pairing with the famous Gary Payton made them a menacing duo. Payton was known for his perimeter defense, yapping on the court and Sean was an underrated rim protector. After Xavier McDaniels left the team, it was an opportunity for the two to step up. Sean stepped up and took on the scoring role and Payton was their facilitator. That led to action-packed highlights every night they played. The Sonics had a level of swag that other teams didn't. 
They were a solid team that played with harmony on defense, and when they needed a hammer on offense, they went to Kemp. Look at this dunk on 7 foot Alton Lister. If no one saw him as a threat before, people knew that he was an aerial threat now. He was the star man, the action man, and their highlight superstar, just like the people watching this who choose to subscribe. So where did it all go wrong? Sean would go on to win gold in 1994 in the FIBA tournament and eventually make a finals appearance against Jordan in 1996 where they would obviously lose. But they would decide to give the team one more year but eventually they blew it up. He would get traded to the Cavs where he would have three all-star level seasons before getting traded to Portland. This was the downfall. He would go from a starter to a bench player. His minutes would get slashed it was here in 2001 that he would turn to cocaine and it was reported that he was undergoing rehab. Once his contract ended in 2003, no team wanted to take a chance on the 33 year old. He would continue to battle drug use and in 2005, he was actually found with a gun, marijuana and cocaine at a routine police traffic stop. Kemp would find peace though, get back on his feet and begin his entrepreneurship journey. And then randomly in 2023, he pled guilty to being part of a drive-by shooting. I honestly, cannot tell you what happened. I think the downfall began with a dramatic drop off after being traded to Portland. He went from being the man to nobody. Mentally that can put your mind in such a weird place. Your ego is fighting with reality and at times you might just do some crazy thing. But let's jump into candidate C, the biggest what if case in NBA history. It's not Derrick Rose, it's not Penny Hardaway or T-Mac, it's Len Bias. Many of you made comments about him in the last video, so it only made sense for me to talk about him in this video. 6'8 and 210 pounds, Len Bias was an NBA ready small forward that could handle the ball, shoot and dunk on anyone that was in his way. He would spend four years at Maryland where he would assert his dominance after year two. He would win ACC player of the year twice, ACC all first team twice, become a two time all American ACC athlete of the year and ACC tournament MVP. With a resume like this, what could go wrong? In the 1983 to 84 season, he was competing for who would be the face of the ACC conference. Note that Jordan was also part of the ACC conference. He would also declare for the draft this year and make himself the talk of the nation. Yet, there was a constant conversation of which player is better. In this year, Len would lead his team to the conference championship and also win ACC tournament MVP. As a college player, he was way more versatile than Jordan. His height and strength already made him a better defender. And then his athleticism was icing on the cake. He was able to move more laterally like a guard and touch the trees like a big. This is a player that showed constant improvement. In year one, he averaged 7.5 as a rookie. He wasn't a starter. In year two, he doubles it, 15 points a game. By year three, he was one of the leading scorers in college with 18 points, but it was in his fourth year when he was averaging 24 and seven that he would solidify himself as a man amongst boys in college. By the end of his college career, he was ready for the draft. In 1986, he would enter the draft and get selected second overall by the Celtics. They were already a championship team and he would be the young piece that could complete their dynasty. Imagine him playing next to Larry Bird. It just, it was crazy scenes. They would have had championships lined up for the rest of the decade, maybe lengthened Larry Bird's career. But then two days after the 1986 draft, News Station, this is Eyewitness News at noon. Len Bias, the Maryland University basketball star on his way to becoming a world champion Boston Celtic, died of an apparent heart attack to 911 would get a call saying that Len Bias was not breathing. That night, after taking a line of cocaine, he would die. And that was the end of Len Bias, the biggest what if in NBA history. Now, following his death, the NBA decided to crack down on cocaine. In fact, his death rocked the whole nation and the United States government started to make changes. People say that Len was probably a better player than Jordan. I would still say Jordan was the better one because he was committed to basketball and his off-court activities never actually affected him or his life on the court. So with that being said, for my sixth man of my cocaine starting five, I pick Rory Tarpley. I needed a five, someone that could be a presence in the paint, but then I also needed someone that could come off the bench and he was the perfect sixth man. He'd been there, done that. And of course, finally, I needed someone that had done cocaine. 
Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, I mean, I did take a bit of a darker note towards the end. I do think that cocaine is a serious topic. Um, and I hope this video educated you on the facts that it can ruin lives and it does end lives. So that being said, if you did enjoy the video, please drop a like. And if you have any comments, please let me know down below. Here are two videos that you might be interested in. But for now, I'll talk to you next time.